Uh, well, I think probably like a lot of people in this room that um, I've, I've always written. I found it uh, cathartic, therapeutic, uh, helpful. Um, I've always, everyone has, that's what you were saying, Graham, everyone has stories to tell. Um, can I tell you a quick story to illustrate this? I, I've been an actor and a writer all my life, uh, which means that I've had to do other jobs. Uh, and so when my kids were young, I did a lot of painting and decorating. Uh, I was painting and decorating in North London in uh, Stoke Newington. And the woman I was decorating for, uh, a jazz singer, called uh, Jackie Dankworth, who is Cleo Lane's daughter. Sorry, this sounds like terrible name dropping. Uh, oh, I was yeah, painting yeah. and decorating. I wasn't uh, working with these people. She said, when you've got your radio on, could you keep it a bit quiet uh, when you're on the first floor? Because we let out a room to a writer. And I thought, yeah, everyone else in North London is a writer, you know. So uh, I, was, I was decorating away. And this very shy man kept coming out of his room to use the loo and go back. And I was you know, splashing magnolia all over the place. Uh, and I got talking to this guy and he was from the Northeast and he was a very, very nice, very shy, couldn't look me in the eye. And uh, after a while, of course, I said to him, well, what are you doing? And he said, I'm writing a film script. And I thought, yeah, yeah, you and everyone else in North London, you know. And I said, what's the idea? And he said, it's about a, it's about a lad that comes from the part of the country I come from. And he wants, he's uh, from a working class background and he wants to be a painter, uh, he painter and decorator. He wants to be a ba <laughs> he wants to be, why not? why not? That would have been a better film. No, he said, I want to be, he wants to be a ballet dancer. Now, of course, this was Lee Hall and he was writing Billy Elliot. And, and, and I oh thought, yeah, yeah, it's oh just, it's just happenstance. It was nothing to do with me. I was just painting and decorating there. But I remember, no, this is the point I'm getting to. I remember thinking, yeah, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> and of course, what it is, is every story, and that is an ordinary story, really, isn't it? Yeah. A lad from the Northeast wants to be a ballet dancer. On paper, that is a very... And of course, where the magic is and where the money is and where the meat is, I don't mean that literally, I just mean it in a theater, theatrical way, is how you tell that story, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's, I mean, his beautiful writing in that is just, and, you know, the Sorry. unusual lines and the... Mm -hmm. Just, uh, but I remember my initial reaction was, yeah, yeah, that's all right. That seems like a good idea. So uh, one of the things I asked was whether, have you got, have you brought any kind of a bit of A bit of that. I, I think it's like everything in life. I think it's specific to you and your personality. I mean, if you read books about writing, it'll say you need to put in your diary, I'm writing and don't answer the phone and don't, you know, and a lot of writers who are, who are doing well enough, they'll, they'll have an, they'll hire a rent an office, won't they? And go to it every day rather than writing at home, because of course at home, the phone rings, the kids come into the room, whatever. Uh, I, I, I don't do that. It's, it's completely uh, random for me and I don't think that it's necessarily a good way or a bad way Graham sorry to not give a great answer but uh, I just uh, it's it, it's random times that I do it it's when I feel like doing it we it, there'll be that thing of starting off and you just know within 10 minutes nothing you know you're wasting your time and I think rather than keeping going at those moments it's probably best to just I find walking really helpful. That's just a personal thing of mine. If I get stuck, uh, just just uh, walk. And I always remember that. I mean, let's never forget the word drama is uh, the Greek word for conflict. So you always have to have conflict, always. I know it sounds daft, but if you're writing the gentlest, um, shortest briefest vignette that's full of love and charm and no one falls out it's you still have to have conflict and that will drive the uh, that will drive the play and can i can i just recommend a book please, please, please. so i did a i was lucky enough to do a workshop with a man called stephen jeffries i don't know if anyone knows, he's dead now um stephen jeffries did a lot of adap adaptations of uh, famous books like Bleak House was a huge, huge hit at the Royal Court for him and he was a, a wonderful playwright. But what he discovered halfway through his career that giving talks, masterclasses on playwriting was what he was best at. And it, it, he was hugely, hugely successful and a lot of playwrights um, put him down as a huge inspiration. He died of a brain tumour quite young. But he, before he died, he wrote uh, his 
workshop, which was a whole day thing and completely wonderful, uh, he wrote it up into a book and it's called, typically unpretentiously of Stephen Jeffries, it's called Playwriting and it's by Stephen Jeffries and I would really recommend, wow, wow, good tip. it's just really practical uh, uh, help with getting stuck. He has sections on character, um, structure, um, how to organize a play. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. I would recommend it. Um, very slowly, I think, is the answer to that. I, with, with Body Double, because it was a thriller and very plot bound, I, 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 I devised the plot first and then I hung the characters on that because the characters were ultimately devices for the plot to work. Right. And for, uh, uh, other plays, of course, aren't about that. Um, I've written a play about a ladies' bowls team, which was done at the Loft, which is not plot bound. It's just about women talking, five middle-aged women in a clubhouse talking about life. Um, and that was a very different approach. I, th I don't know how to answer your question, Graham. Sorry, I'm really, it's really unhelpful. But that thing that people say, and it sounds a bit pretentious, but I really think it's true, and other writers here I think will probably have experienced this, that after a while the characters do start sort of talking mm. for themselves. Mm. Mm. And you do realise that, oh, uh, that line came out without me really thinking about it. Yeah. But I think for that to start to happen, you really have to uh, spend a lot of time I mean, I think writing a play takes, a, I don't know if everyone else finds, but takes a hell of a lot of time. How much time does it take you? Weeks and weeks, months and months, I think. For me, yeah. uh, because I think what you do is you have to ease yourself into that world. There are no quick, um, you know, you hear about people like Noel Coward, don't you? Who could write a play in a weekend and Alan Akebourne who writes a play every year and all that. But I bet they do a hell of a lot of thinking before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously not Noel Coward because he's dead, but I mean, they, I bet they do a hell of a lot of thinking. And yeah, that's a story. That's a, a, a play essentially based on my granddad. But uh, the other thing that somebody said to me once, and I think this is a really useful tip. Um, sometimes if you have two or three ideas and you merge them into one play, that can really that can really work. Because sometimes one idea is just like a bit small, especially if you're writing a full length play. So sometimes, and Into the Breach is a case of this, that's sort of three ideas I had independently of each other that have come into one play because then, of course, you get, you get conflict then because, those, uh, because the three ideas usually have um, attention all of their own. And that's, and that's what you want to get on stage. That's, you know that thing of when you're, in, you know, you're in a theatre and you're watching a play and you realise the last 20 minutes have gone by and you didn't know where it's gone? is because the playwright who really knows what they're doing has created a huge amount of tension. And it may be just two people having a cup of tea together, but the tension in the dialogue and mm. in, the, um, in the relationship between the two of them. So I'm, 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 I, I feel I'm lucky as a playwright because I know lots of actors and, and you know, I was an actor first as it were, although I've always been writing, but I, you know, um, so what I do, this is how I do it. So I'll write, and I think Nick works this way as well. So you, you write a first draft and then you get some actors together to read it. And the actors are brilliant at saying to you, that line don't make any sense at all. And I really don't, they immediately take ownership of a part and they'll start telling you, uh, you know, whether, you, whether that line makes sense, whether you, you, they feel that that character would say something like that. And that's extraordinarily helpful, I find. Uh, the other thing is, the other danger with writing dialogue, as we all know, is that it, it can all sound like your voice, you know? Mm. So you've got five different characters, you know, one's from Venezuela and one's from South Wales and one is from London, but they're all your voice, essentially. They're all your rhythms, the, what, the things you say, the phrases you use. And if you get actors involved, it's a cheat, really, you know, you're, you're piggybacking off their skills. But if you can get some actors to workshop a play that you've written, I would recommend that no end because uh, you just... And also to hear it in the air. When you're sitting at your computer or you're writing at your notepad, isn't it, Nick? Yeah, you know, and then when you hear actors saying it in the air, you think, oh my God. When you read books about how to write a play, and I did a a course at the Mary Ward Centre in creative writing. The, you know, people who teach creative writing will tell you that there are rules. And of course, to hear rules and to 
um, and to think about them and then to either take them on board or reject them is, is really helpful. I would suggest there probably aren't uh, any rules. And if there are rules, it would be very good to try and break them because I mm. think uh, then, you, but then you get that tension, don't you? Then you get that jeopardy that we're all, that we're all after. Um, I, I, the, other, the other big thing, and this is stating the bleeding obvious, as Monty Python would say, um, is to just do a lot of it, you know? Just, I mean, I do it all the time, all the time, always writing, 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 you know? Um, just everything that, that comes into your mind, ideas, thoughts, phrases, watch people, listen to how they say things, uh, and just, you know, and, I mean, Shakespeare, for instance, I mean, he must have just taken on board everything that happened in his life, mustn't he? He just must have done and everything he heard, because how could you, you know, the amount of observation and I mean, just obviously he's a freak of nature that we're talking about. But, you know, to use the best example, he. You always have things in a play, I think, that you really like. I love that idea. In fact, William Goldman, I think, invented that phrase, kill your babies. Um, and how it came about was when he wrote the screenplay for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, his whole idea for writing that screenplay was a story that he'd heard about the two of them. And it was the core of his screenplay. It was the absolute reason why he'd written the whole thing. It was the inspiration and the, uh, he just loved that detail of them. And he thought that that's where the whole um, screenplay, in the end, he had to cut that scene because, mm. <laughs> because after many drafts and working on it, he realized that the play had grown away from that and had become uh, a thing on its own. And that I initial scene, uh, that story about Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid wasn't it wasn't necessary anymore. And it took lots of producers saying to him, Bill, that scene has to go. And he went, no, no, I love that scene. Wow. No, it has to go. And then the actors got hold of it and they said, what's that scene? And in the end, he had to admit, and he said the lesson he learned from that, because he was a young man when he wrote that, he said, the lesson I learned from that is that you do often have to kill your babies, which was the thing that you that you were bringing up. So you... I don't know. I'm I'm so rubbish on the process of it, Graham. I'm really sorry. I I just think that you develop an instinct mm -hmm. that you. Mm -hmm. And going back to the thing about getting actors involved. Get actors involved, and they'll tell you, either directly or in in indirectly, um, because all the other great thing about actors is they all work in a very different way. Some don't they, Lily? Some work inside out. Some have to know what the shoes are like before they can play the part. You know, so they're all very, then you've got this whole melting pot of um, of ideas. I mean, I love things that you know that playwrights who understand theatre and direct and act as well say about stuff like Harold Pinter, for instance. You know. Uh, you know, they, I heard a story that he was rehearsing a play and a young actor trying to impress him said, Harold, Harold, where's where's my character been before he comes into this room? And Harold Pinter went, in the wings. <laughs> uh, you know, so, <laughs> which is, I, I absolutely see what he was saying, but I think what he was actually saying was, that's for you to decide. I'm not going to tell you that's that. That's for you as a... As a as an actor to decide, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And he, and he, sorry, I meant to explain this. He he was directing one of his own plays. I think yeah. it was The Homecoming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know that absolutely wonderful play. Um, I just do that thing that Jez Butterworth that. said that you, if you are not excited by every moment in your play, ah. then then you know it's not. I've read in one book about playwriting. You're you're you're, you're given twenty minutes freedom at the start because they're enjoying the set and actors coming on and uh, they're out at the theatre and it's Friday evening and they've had a gin and tonic so you're allowed I, I think that's just such rubbish I think you've got a you know and and if anyone saw Jerusalem the Jez Butterworth play but you know the way that starts you just think you're not gonna it's not you know how well, how can you start a play like that it's gonna be downhill from now on yes. but it somehow isn't uh, so I think that thing of what he says about you absolutely bang it at 10 from the very start and wow. stay there wow. is what you're aiming to do. Of course, nobody can do that. You can't achieve, even the great Jez Butterworth probably doesn't achieve that. But I think that's got to be your aim, hasn't it? So answering your question, I don't think you, well, for me anyway, I'm, I'm never thinking, oh, so I've had this page and a half of dialogue, something's got to happen. 
I think if you're if you're telling a story that's interested enough and you're invested enough in it, and uh, th then things are going to happen. Because like Jez Butterworth says, if I'm excited by it, then... You, you, may, you, you may be right. right. You may be right, Graham. You may be absolutely right. I, yes, it's not something I, uh, I, I, I've ever thought about. Uh, it's, the, the thing that Stephen Jeffries talks about is you've got to absolutely know what play you're writing. Uh, you know, I mean, the obvious thing is, am I writing a thriller? Am I writing a love story? Am I writing a radio play? Am I writing a one-act play? You've got to absolutely know what you're writing before you start. This is one of the points he makes. And I think if you're writing um, a thriller, say, where you're trying, when you've got to keep the audience engaged and uh, because this is one of the really difficult things, I, th I think the most difficult thing about playwriting is exposition. How, mu how much do you give the audience, how much do you uh, impart information to the audience so that they stay with it, and how much do you hold back so that they want to know more? I think that is so tricky. Um, a play like The Government Inspector, I mean, it just does it wonderfully doesn't it i mean you just it keeps you uh, it's just a, it, it, you know it's a master class isn't it of keeping the audience guessing so what i'm saying i think graham is if you give the audience too much information and they know everything that's going to happen next obviously you've lost them but if you but if they're lost off watching and they don't know what the hell is going on you've also lost them i think that balance is one of the tricks